Matthew speaks of it, John speaks of it, and Mark speaks of it in different places in their gospel. But I want to deal with this piece in Luke, the ninth chapter, 10 through 17. Uh, when you get that saying, man, you don't have to stand in it. But when you get it, say, Amen. 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 Let's pray for a minute. Father God, we come down to the master's name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Disconnected. Bluetooth. Aaron. We thank you for your awesomeness in our lives. We thank you for our awesomeness in our praise. We thank you for how you lifted us to a level where God and only God can see, deal, and hear us. Now, Father God, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you bless this word on today. Feed us with manna from on high, Lord, that our lights uh, might be bright, that we might shine our life for you, Lord, everywhere we go. Let this little light of mine and of ours shine for you, Father God. You said in your word that our lights so shine before me. They see that they may see our good works and glorify you, which is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This was an interesting passage of scripture for uh, when I read it, I was the Sunday school lesson happened to be in my mind and uh, about the injustice pieces. And so some of the pieces uh, parallel into there because that's what my mindset was. But uh, what I want to talk about this morning comes out of the 12th verse and it thus reads, and when the day began to wear away, then came the 12 and said unto him, send the multitude away that they may go into the towns and country round about and lodge and get vectors, for we are here in a desert place. But when he said unto them, he says, give me them something to eat. And they said, we have no more but five loaves and two fish, except we should go and buy meat for all these people. For they were about 5,000. He said to the disciples, make them sit down by 50. In other words, make them sit down in groups of 50 and make those groups of 50 groups of 500. And they did so and made them all sit down. Then he took the fish and the bread and looking to heaven, he blessed them. And he broke it and gave to the disciples. And the disciples set it before the multitude. And they did eat and were all filled, having about 12 baskets left. I want to just talk just for a brief minute about when God makes no sense. When serving God, when God's instruction to you makes absolutely, positively no sense at all. Are you with me? I think I'm in here by myself. But anyway, all of us have had experiences, all of us have had things, all of us have had situations, problems, blessings, reports that have made Absolutely no sense. Everybody ever had this, but to go to the doctor and he say that you have a condition and he shows you your x-rays and they come back the next week and, and he put up the same x-ray a week later and the hole, the spot, the dent, the mark, whatever it is that was there last week is no longer on the screen this week. And it puzzles even the elect because it does what? Make no sense. Are you hearing me? Uh, 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 but there are times, and that's what I want to talk about today, because see, we understand by man's logic the things that make sense. Can I give you an example? When I when you say to me two uh, oranges uh, and, and two apples equal four pieces of fruit, uh, but what happens when, when, when God says that two and five 
equals 20,000, guess what happens? It makes no sense. It makes no sense how we can go day to day uh, being blessed by God and don't acknowledge him in nothing that goes on in our life. It makes no sense when you know that human logic tells you one thing, but the word of God tells you something different. Your human is say, I've got an incurable cancer, but the word of God say that you can look at the impossible and you can you can you can experience the intangible. Stop looking for a miracle. If you can look for it and expect it if the word of God says so, even when it does not appear to be or seem to be what it is that we think it ought to be. We understand by man's logic that things can be proven by specific proof is called a fact. Let me tell you what fact is. A fact is uh, uh, a fact before I do that, but all provable facts of man may not be a spiritual fact. Now that already got some big fans, but that's okay. What, 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 I'm going to say that again. But all provable facts by man may not be a fact in the spirit world. Just because you've been counted out in the physical, in the human world, does not mean that you are counted out in the spiritual world. God uses people. He uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things mean that you can never ever be counted out in God. You can't be counted out because just before you hit uh, in this, in this world, God already had plans for you. He was able, he picked out your parents. He, he picked out your childhood. He picked out how it was going to go. He picked out how many times you would go to jail, how many times you would get drunk. All of those things were known by God. And when man said you wouldn't be nothing, God raised you up to be something great in the spiritual world. There's a lot of preachers and pastors who were nothing before God got his hands on them. And when God put his hands on them, he changed them from a good, an a, a alley, a, a person to somebody in great respect of the spirit world. Why? Because, just because man tell you you ain't gonna make it, just because he tell you it's impossible, does not, does not define who you are when God is in the plane. Hallelujah. But all, oh, I said, for a fact, is a thing that is known or proven to be true in this world. A fact, the quality of being actual, uh, actually a question of fact hinges on evidence. A fact known has a scientific method or a scientific basis for in the principle uh, of a fact uh, is a process of discovery and demonstration considered characteristic of or necessary for a scientific investigation, for a hypothesis, for experiments around the hypothesis to come out with a tangible result. And that result now becomes a fact based on the fact that in the human world, you was able to test it, make theories about it, prove it one way or the other, and, and then that's how it becomes a fact. That's how mathematics is discovered. If I take 12 uh, pieces of candy and I eat one, uh, that doesn't mean I have 14 pieces of candy left. It means that in the human world, I got 11. But if you look at this text today, you find out uh, that just because two and five may be seven to you, it may not be seven in the hands of God. Have I got a witness? You think about your life. Just because they said what they said didn't make it over. When the doctor said it's over for you and, and you're still here, that means that you became, you either you are beyond the fact, you are a miracle, or God stepped in. Have a matter when it's a fact, I tell you. But what happens when the logic of man has no bearings when the fact is spiritual? It's spiritual that he said we would be the head and not the tail. It's spiritual he said we're above and not the It's spiritual that he has a cattle upon a thousand hill and whatsoever is, is his is yours by the adoption that you are heir, a joint heir with Jesus Christ in the, in the kingdom of God. It's spiritual. The things in your life that seem to not make sense are spiritual things once you hooked up with Jesus Christ. 
Once you gave your life to him, once you became on his side, once he covered you in his blood and all, now makes sense that the things of this world may not make sense, but, they, but in God's world, everything is tangible. Have I got a witness? Jesus is told um, in this text, he's told uh, that John the Baptist has been beheaded because the stepdaughter of Herod wanted his head on the platter as a birthday present. Can you imagine Jesus standing there hearing that news, wondering what type of person would have most somebody else killed as a birthday present? So Jesus is looking at this situation as though, guess what? It don't make sense. There's something about this situation does not make sense whatsoever. And, and so now his puzzlement has taken him to go seek God and to go hear and commune with God. First point, when things in your life don't make sense, and it ain't got to make sense to the rest of the world, when things don't make sense, you got to go back to the sense maker and talk to him about what, what's going on. Uh, how things are going. In fact, uh, uh, Abitina said, uh, makes no difference. Uh, whatever the situation is, I can go to God in prayer. And a fellow over in our hymn book said, I, you know, I can go to him in secret prayer and leave my burden there. When things seem to be topsy turvy, tough and rough, you got to go back to the sense maker. Have I got a witness? And in this text, Jesus now goes back to talking to God. And, and, and talking to him about what does not make sense. Jesus and the disciples leave and the crowd begins to follow him over everywhere he goes. What they know is about Jesus is there's some stuff that's going on with him that doesn't make sense. There was a man whose ears uh, were stuck up and Jesus came by and put his fingers in his ears and they told him a few things and said some stuff to him and the stuff that the doctors had been telling him all his life that made sense, Jesus said that stuff doesn't make sense but if you want uh, to hear again here is what you have to do and when the man begins to do what God tells him to do, the stuff that don't make sense, even though it, it shouldn't make sense, not all of a sudden makes sense he said look I don't know how it happened I can't tell you what happened I don't know about the bumbo jumbo. All I know is, is that I met a man named Jesus. When I met him, he told me this here. This is how you go about with me restoring your hearing. And when I did what he told me to do, the stuff they said could not happen began to happen. The stuff they said did not or would not work began to work. Why? Because I met a man who made sense out of no sense. The Bible says that Christ begins to teach and heal them, everyone following is only there uh, to seek Jesus out. And the funny part about it is, even consistent to this day, everybody that comes to follow Jesus is not following Jesus because they're part of it. Anyway, now nobody, they, they come with all kind of other things on their mind. Some people only follow God for the stuff they can get. They don't follow him, they don't give him their whole heart. They're only here to get a man or to get a house or to get a car or to get a better job. They're not here giving him their substance. Why? Because all they're trying to do is get from God. And when you come to get from God, you may get some stuff, but guess what? You won't get the real stuff because the real stuff that makes sense is the stuff that don't make sense. And that is, is that God loved us so much so that he gave his son to die for us. And so what happens here, uh, everybody following him, I said, it's only there, uh, and not everybody's there with their heart, but they're there for the stuff that he done. My nephew uh, is sick, I'm gonna take him to old Jesus. My mama has got a lip, I'm gonna take her to see Jesus. I'm going uh, so that my sins uh, may not be forgiven, but I can be healed of my infirmities. Uh, Jesus sometimes was the resort or the last resort that came up. Why? Because as long as they had human sense, they didn't believe the stuff that was going over there in that tent made sense. So here, um, in this in this text, we find uh, Jesus going on by himself, and when it gets late, guess what? He begins to be concerned about the crowd. I'm so glad that God has compassion for me, even when nobody else sees the worthiness of having compassion for me. He's always looking out 
for me. Have I got a witness? And so in this in this 12th verse, he begins to get concerned and he tells the, the, the disciples, tell him, Lord, you gotta let these people go. Don't do no more healings, don't do nothing else for them, but let them go because it's late and I know they're hungry. We don't want them falling out in the desert, so let them go so they can go get what they need, the sufficiency, so that nothing happens to them. But see, they don't realize that who they're talking to is the sense that makes no sense. Have I got a witness? And so the disciples think to do what is humanly makes sense. They said, look, uh, we understand uh, that the COVID is running wild and rapid in this community, so we need to go take so I've heard everything, goji berries, uh, stock up on vitamin E, uh, get you some nose spray. I done heard eat, uh, eat oranges, vitamin C, echo berries. That everybody got some remedy for COVID. They don't realize, hey man, that COVID was here long before they gave it a name. And the person who kept COVID off of us was not a doctor, but it was Dr. Jesus. Wow. They, they, they talking a whole lot of stuff about the pandemic, uh, thinking that what you're doing and what they're doing is different. But guess what? Before, uh, there was a win and a word. Uh, the pandemic was already on the mind of God. He decided who was going to get it, how bad it was going to be, and what its effects was going to be. Why? Because that's the type of God that we serve. So they say to him, they say to him, they say, look here. Think what we can do humanly to make sense of this situation is to send them Oh, wait, now listen, now listen. Uh, Matthew 19 and 26 says, But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men, this is possible. But with God, I'm sorry, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Now look, look, look here why he tells them that. They don't, they, they don't consult Jesus when they go to him about their eating. They go tell him what, what, what should be done. No, 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 I got a hold right there because that's a problem that we have. Even in our prayer, we don't consult God. We go tell Him about our problems. Are you hearing me? We go and say, Lord, I got so and so side of the for me coming up. Make sure uh, I make it everything all right. Lord, I got bills and I don't have enough money. So I'm asking you, Lord, to fix it for me so that my bills are paid, that my doctor. Gives me a good report that my job hangs on to me. They go to Jesus and instead of talking to him about the situation, they tell him what they want him to do. That's very important because when you tell him what you want to do, you eliminate him telling you what to do. You go and tell him how you want this to go. And I'm so glad he don't listen to us when we go to him with that stuff because all of our end, well, all of us would be there because we got enemies who would go to God and say, destroy so and so, knock his legs off, let him fall into a ditch. I'm glad that God don't move based on us telling him what to do, but he tells us not only what to do, but how to do it. They go and tell God what they want him to do. Jesus, it's getting late. You send these people away so that they can get what they need. But they don't understand that they're with an all sufficiency, all knowing God, who can do anything but fail. Have I got a witness? They don't realize uh, that Proverbs 3 and 5 says to trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not into thy own understanding and all thy ways and not into him and he will direct that path. They don't understand that when you go to God and you to talk to God, it is a communication. It's not like you telling him what to do because you need him more than he needs you. In fact, he don't need us at all. He didn't need us when he put the sun in the sky. He don't need, he didn't need us when he told the light to get on one side and drop to get on the other. He didn't even need you this morning when he touched you with a fingertip of love and told you to come on back. I still got work for you to do. He didn't need you. He didn't need you when he saw him, got you and kept you safe getting to church. He won't need you going home. He won't need you breathing. He won't need you regulating your heart. He won't need you regulating your mind. He don't need us in any of the process that he's been doing all as long as we've been here and long. He didn't need you when he went to the cross. Didn't need you when they pierced him in the side. Didn't need you early that Sunday morning when he rose from the grave. He does not need us. But we need him. We need him in everything that we do. Uh, Acts 16 and 24 says, having received such a charge, he put them 
until they get in prison and fasten their feet and then stop from getting ahead of myself. But we didn't need us. We need to consult him. And that's a problem for us. We don't consult God about the things that are going on in our life. Consult him means is that we go to him and ask him the questions. How do I get out of this situation? How do I breathe through this? How do I maintain my peace while I'm going through a tough situation? How do I stand in a storm and still be able to come out smiling? We go in telling him what we want him to do, but we never consult him about what to do. And so God just sits back and wait on us in the storm until we finally get to the place where we shut our mouth, we stop moving our hands, and we let him wait. That's where that verse came from Acts 16 and 24. It says that when Paul and Silas was put in jail for doing the things of God, not only did they put him in jail, they put him in the inner circle of the jail, and then they bound him uh, uh, by a wall. Why? Because they didn't want them to move. Sometimes God has to put us in positions where we can either move, think, or talk. Because as long as we can work our mouth, we get in more trouble by the things we do and say. So he said, look, Paul and Silas, in order to show these people that I'm bigger and greater than anything they can ever think or design, I'm going to let them put you in jail. I'm going to let them lock you up in jail. And then I'm going to let them bound you in jail. All they can do is think of the goodness of Jesus locked up, bound up, and tied up. And when they began to think about the goodness of Jesus, that worship and that praise came out, and when they began to worship, God, you gotta remember, whoever two or three are gathered in my name, touching and agreeing, I'll be in the midst of that. He began to inhabit or live in the praises of Paul and Silas. They weren't able to touch one another, but they was able to say, God is good. And the other one said, uh-huh, all the time. And the other one said, all the time, God is good. And before you know it, they were saying hallelujah to a God who's good in spite of where I am and in spite of my situation. They said, look at God, it's better than I ever thought he could be because even being locked up, tied up, and bound, he's still good. I feel him moving on the inside of me, even though I'm in a situation, I mean, have you ever been in a situation where everything seemed to be on the losing end, but God comes in and gives you joy right in the midst of all that? People say, look here, I don't understand why it is that you seem to be smiling and happy about the goodness of God. How can you be happy when they have just put Bobo in the, in the grave? How can you be happy when your child is going through some stuff? Well, because I got a God who's able to keep me even in perfect peace if I just put my mind. Oh, yeah, Acts 16 and 24 says that they put them in. They tied them up and locked them down. I'm almost done. It makes no sense of what was going on in the stock room where everybody else was able to walk around. It made no sense that Paul and Silas would be in there giving God praise. A normal man would be in there cussing him, wondering why. I got myself, and how do we get in this situation, and how do we get out? But they began to consult God and not ask God to get them out of the chains. Have, you, have I got a witness? But Luke 9 and 13 says, he tells them, look at here, while y'all asking me to do something, you need to be the ones that feed them and give them what they need. And what he was trying to tell them, is, is that the stuff you're asking me to do is the same stuff that you're able to do. But you got to change your focus. Your focus should be on uh, uh, coming to me to tell me what to do, but coming to me asking me, Lord, what can we do to give them what they need in this world? And so they began, he said, look, you change your focus on how you're doing things and you'll find out that whatever you ask in my name uh, and that not shall be done. Not coming in, giving God the commands of how to work things out and how to do the things in your life, but going and ask God, Lord, I, I'm, I'm in this situation over here and I kind of don't know how to navigate through it, but I know you know, look at here, my slaves, I know you know the things that have to happen because you know everything. You knew you brought me into this situation. Now, how do I do what I need to do? And it makes sense because right now, looking at this mob of people, it does not makes sense. It says, uh, he said, but you have only five loaves of bread and two fish they had answered. And he said to him, listen, it doesn't matter what I got and what you see. 
a little become much when you place it in my hand. So what I'm telling you to do is, is when you consult me, I'll tell you how to turn what you're trying to do into success. Why? Because it does not have to make sense to everybody in the room, just the person who has to perform the task. It doesn't have to make sense uh, to the doctor um, that you don't have the cancer no more. It's his job to say what he see on the screen and move on. It doesn't have to make sense in a car wreck that you get out and walk and go home and nothing be wrong with you all. He want people to know he is, is that there's somebody who was keeping you while everything was going toxic-turvy around you that was keeping you when things seemed like they was going to destroy you. There was something on the inside and then that was holding the reins and keeping you from getting what you were supposed to get and sending you home for people to see what was going on. So, so, so he said to them, they say, look, all we got is this fish and this bread. And he said, but there's 5,000 people in the crowd. We need to go buy something else. But Jesus said to him, look at here, boys. When you're dealing with me, you got everything you need already there. You got everything that, that you need to feed 5,000 men, not counting women and children, because it's not what you see uh, that, that, that gives you the victory. It's what you don't see. I'm a God who has everything in the palm of my hands and all I've got to do is rain, weak or blink and things get in the natural order of me. Listen here, my brothers and sisters, when you are in a relationship with the living God, whatever he says is possible, it is possible. Even when it looks like that you're not going to make it in the storm, if he said you're going to make it, guess what? You might as well count on it being done. When he said that you can do what they said that can never be done, you got to count it as being done. When I walk um, into my job, I count it as a date for God. When I come into the church, I count it as a date for God. But whatsoever you say does not matter. But when God begins to speak over my life, some things happen that normally would not make sense in, in your world, but in the spiritual world, it has to come true. Do you remember as I closed Lazarus, um, when Lazarus died and Mary and Martha sent them over the sea uh, to come to the funeral of Lazarus? They said, look here, Jesus, if you had been uh, here, Lazarus uh, would not have died. And now you come for the memorial service uh, just to say a few words over Lazarus. Had you come three days ago when the funeral was going on, we may have been able to give you a spot. But Jesus told them to look here, Mary and Mark, get out the way and let me do what I came here to do. It ain't got nothing to do with when I come. The Bible says it's just that I come. And whenever I come, the atmosphere must give way to who I am. to the house. 
that he sent his son to die for me. I don't know why this was a song to you. Jesus loved me. I don't know why he cares. I don't know why he sacrificed his life for me. Oh, but I'm glad. So glad he did. Where would I be if he didn't love me? Where would I be if he didn't care? Where would I be if he had sacrificed his life? But I'm glad. Amen. So glad he did. God, serving God, living with God, makes no sense. The love of God shall grow even when it makes no sense. He got all of us. Not to deserve it, really, but because he loved us. Well, because we're good, because he loved us. Well, because we'll never do something that matters. We need the same grace, the same mercy as everybody who won the us. Martin Luther King, as great as he was, Gandhi, you name him. It is the same grace, the same mercy that each one of us does. But God makes sense out of our lives. Gave us eternal life. 